Welcome back, everyone, uh, to part two of Newcastle Noir Crime Fiction Festival uh, online, a little mini festival that we thought we would put together uh, for the month when we normally gather in Newcastle in the City Library to celebrate the best of crime fiction, local, national and international. If you were with us at the start of the month of May, which is when we normally hold it, um, we put together six panels for that first weekend in May um, to ensure that the spirit of Newcastle Noir was still there. So many people uh, watched those videos and so many people commented on just how much they'd enjoyed that weekend that of course well you guessed it we're crazy for crime fiction all the authors who were meant to be present in newcastle so many you know have said oh wish we could do something uh, and so we went ahead and we've put together another weekend's criminal delights for you uh, We've made it three panels each day, so um, setting off uh, Friday uh, four o'clock, and then at seven o'clock, and then at nine o'clock each day. Uh, the recordings uh, will go up live on each of those days, uh, and then they will remain on the Newcastle Noir YouTube channel uh, for your pleasure and delight. Uh, really appreciate your feedback as well, and really appreciate you being here. You know, it's almost been another month in, in lockdown since we last met. Um, and so thank you for joining us. Uh, and as I always say, I hope you're well and I hope you're safe. Um, and I, I look forward to the day when we can join together uh, physically to celebrate crime fiction. So enjoy the weekend with us or dip in and out when you can. If you're watching this after everything's gone live, you know, thank you so much uh, for your support for Newcastle Noir. Our plan is simply to roll out next year the program that would have been this year. Um, so, you know, if you can make it to Newcastle in 2021 to see these authors uh, talk a year later about their work and what's happening, you would be most welcome. But for now, enjoy part two of Newcastle Noir 2020 online. Before we go into our first panel, Women in Gangland, just want to, to say that um, at a couple of points in our discussion, we got a little bit excited and a couple of expletives do slip out. Um, so apologies there. Uh, and if you have any young ones with you, um, you may wish to you know, either warn them um, or, or, or not watch with them. But Regardless of that, hope you enjoy. Well, welcome everyone uh, to the Women in Gangland uh, session for part two of Newcastle Noir 2020 online mini festival. If you've Women been watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what? festival in pajamas. Um, if you've been watching with us uh, either when we did the first part. Or, or, or the second part, you know that all this really is to do with the fact that we love our crime fiction. We were gutted not to be able to host the festival uh, in real life, but I'm just so thrilled that authors who were down to be on the programme said they were happy to come uh, and, and be grilled uh, in the Zoom room. Um, and so here we are. I am pleased and thrilled to be able to welcome Marnie Reish uh, and, and Anna Smith, um, who, if you were at Bloody Scotland last year, um, I had such a wonderful time with these women and Manda Suhala, who unfortunately wasn't able to be with us for the festival. Uh, and, but, you know, I couldn't not have them again uh, and, and be able to discuss so but and I know our discussion is going to range over all sorts of things so if you were at that bloody Scotland panel don't think oh I've heard it all I'm sure these women have got many a tale to tell us um, so thank you both 
Um, how are we keeping money? How is it there uh, in, in Manchester? How are you doing? Yeah, it's okay. I mean, I, I spent the first six weeks of lockdown ill, really. Um, I started off, well, I, I was in fine fettle at the beginning. I'd been a bit ill and then I had all these aspirations to be a creative whirlwind and paint pictures and do the gardening and, and do nice baking and maybe write some stuff that you know I wasn't planning on writing and then um I I got bad with possibly with Covid um and then straight after that I came down with a, a, a urinary tract infection that just hung around for a fortnight and I have to say it really knocked the stuffing out of me and um, and by the time I'd finished that, I had so much gardening to catch up with. Because um, for those of you who aren't uh, boring gardeners like me, you know we're in we're in May, late you know late April, May, um, and there's just so much to do: potting up and potting on and planting out. And it, it's just been humdrum, you know. And I, I've been eating too much and drinking too much, and I'm surrounded by my family, but. You get on each other's tits and it's so routine and there's nothing to look forward to really. You know, we had Crime Fest pegged for early June and then there was Harrogate later on in the year and I had loads of really <coughs> cool things planned and a trip to Prague with my family, but it, none of it's happened. And there's just, you know, I feel quite flat now. I've kind of had enough now. So that's me. Yeah, so we can we we could we could, we need to be getting out of this, and 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 hopefully we will. Uh, Anna, how how is it for you? Well, it's just I mean, I was luckily I've been very healthy throughout it, and getting fatter by the minute because you eat all the time. And it's, it was a funny thing. I think the, the beginning there was a there was a shock level that you think, well, I can't do this, and I've been told I can't do this, and I, I never really play by rules, and you've got to do these things. You can't go up to do things in people's houses. You can't go and see your friends. And anyway, we got we, we, <coughs> quite quickly. I think the whole country quite quickly became these people. This is what this is what I like to look at as well. The whole country became quite quickly these almost regimented. We're not allowed to do that. And and then you would you, when you went started to go shopping at Tesco and it was the queues. All that stuff I found a bit almost overwhelming in the beginning. But then you got you got used to it. You fell into it because that's what happens when your country is invaded. You just fall in fall into line. Uh, apparently. Um, so I kind of felt people were, do, were were keeping each other going and having a laugh and you were watching, I was watching your gardening thing and I was fascinated by that, how much work you were doing, Manny. It looked great and I would see the colours now look lovely. And then um, then it just got boring with the, with the cookery. I was making scones that looked nothing like scones and things like that. And then I just got bored. One thing I did do is a power of work because I was doing the, the follow-up to Endgame and it's not due in for months yet, but I thought, I'm just going to bash in and go on with this. And that's good because it gave me a, a routine that I sit down at a certain time every day in the mm -hmm. afternoon. did a lot of that and I've, I've, I've written the end. Uh, it needs a bit of work, but it's not much work now. It's, you know, don't tell my editor that, but I've, I'm well done. Yeah. Um, because, yeah. <laughs> for, that, for that, but I'm like, like Marley and I like everybody else, there's a, there's a feeling, and I think probably in the beginning when they were deciding to lock down, they thought, these people won't handle this. And I think, British people and Scottish people, because sometimes they like to be called separate, but it's just clear we're all Joe Tamsin's bearings. People have really handled it, and if, you know, people have done really well with this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, think, I think increasingly, though, that they're, they're doing less well. Yeah. I was saying to Jackie um, just before that Manchester, the Northwest has got the highest R yeah. um, in the country, or has done for quite some time, and I think that. Um, Mancunians are really bad at towing the line at the best of times. We're a kind of region of rebels, but um, certainly amongst the younger people, the older people are sticking to it, but the younger people have had enough. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. just fed up with it. And, and you're fed up with it all sorts of reasons. Young, young people, because they're not used to being honed in. No. Older people, because they're, they're missing the, the contact with people. And I just think enough is enough now. And whatever's going to happen now, we're just going to have to live with it. It never ever overwhelmed the NHS mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, so we're hoping we're all prepared now. That's mm. Indeed, indeed. But I wonder, could we do something? Could we go back a little bit in time to pre pre COVID and all sorts of things like that? Because I I met you as amazing crime fiction writers, um, not as people suffering this this, this lockdown. 
and and I, I just wonder is what took you you didn't start off as crime fiction writers neither of you mm. Marnie I wonder could you set us off maybe on this journey and and tell us why come to crime fiction you know here we are now you are you know you are a very successful writer both of you you know you have you have you have so many books there to your names but why crime fiction well for me um i started writing when i was in my late 30s and i had a real passion for children's fiction my kids were little at the time and i read a lot of middle grade fiction particularly so I got it into my head. Um, I had been doing some property development, but then there was the, mar the, you know, the housing market collapsed and, and I needed a creative outlet. And I was doing a day job of fundraising um, part time because uh, like I said, my kids were really little and I hated it because I'd done that for like uh, well over a decade earlier in my career and, and just I was good at it, but I hated it. I needed this creative outlet. So I started writing. Um, with the hope of being a really successful children's author. And I did have a series of six books for seven plus year olds published by HarperCollins under a pseudonym called Time Hunters. Um, but I just realized that it wasn't scratching my itch, you know, I mean, my, my taste in fiction and me as a person, you know, I'm far darker. I like grit and violence and swearing and sex and, an intrigue and I wanted to write books that were were much more complex in the telling and you know that were cleverly slotted together jigsaw puzzles and would challenge the reader now when you add to that the fact that I grew up on a very rough council estate in Manchester in the 80s um, and was surrounded by uh, gang warfare and poverty and feral youth and, um, you know, me, me and my single parent mother, uh, we really roughed it. Um, she did some cleaning to make ends meet and it was a real struggle. And uh, the place where we lived was nice in the sort of late 70s when we moved on to our estate in Cheatham. But then it, it very quickly got worse as the kind of kids grew up and, you know, a mixture of lack of opportunity and just the fact that the parents mm -hmm. didn't give, the, give a shit and, and bad influences. The kids got worse and worse and worse to the extent where, I, you know, we were getting petrol bombed and windows smashed. And, you know, I was chased down the road by some kid with a flaming, you know, bough of a tree. <laughs> it, it just got really bad, real kind of borderline PTSD. So when, when I came to write, I just wanted to reflect that sort of gritty urban reality really um and and, and explore the morally gray areas why people do the things they do mm, well, uh -huh, why they do what they do yeah. thank you thank you for that anna was was yours a, a similar journey to, to becoming a crime writer uh, in terms of i suppose in terms uh, Jack, of the darkness and, and, and feeling the darkness and feeling the that kind of uh, sometimes a bit of desolation that you feel when you when, when I was working say I was a journalist at the Daily Record newspaper uh, for people who don't know maybe the sister paper of the mirror at the time and I was in there I was a, when I was what, 22 or something like that 1980s 19 start of 1980 so it was the start of the big heroin explosion and, and I come from a, a village in Lanarkshire where I suppose heroin and all these things only re, only came over here mid 90s but but that time that was you know, I had never seen all the kind of sights that I saw in Glasgow. So you'd be going as a young reporter with a photographer, knocking doors in uh, high flats and, and for the first time being in high flats and seeing all these, seeing a completely other way of life. And my life wasn't um, born out of riches or anything, anything like it, but it was a, a more <laughs> of a small village life and a bit of poverty and things like that, but not, not anything like that, what I saw in Glasgow. And it always just, when I, when I started to work at the record, you were so busy trying to do the job that you didn't think of anything in terms of, I must write this down as a novel. Uh, although I always wanted to write, but it was only once you started getting really involved and in moving through the ranks and, and, and seeing people and talking to gangsters and hard men and seeing the police things and sitting through trials. So you would sit through and you would talk to victims and go to their houses and the stories they would tell that you started to be, I think quite probably subconsciously, every time I went out to some of these areas, in my head, I, would squir I must have been squirreling things away because mm -hmm. characters come at me now that I don't know where they came from. But they're usually built, I write a lot of 
I quite like, I always have like drug addict characters who, are, who I'm always sorry for and the characters are always sorry for them because the ones that I always interviewed weren't trying to steal my money or anything. They were telling me something that nobody would believe them because of who they were. And I had a great empathy for all of that. And, and that was the kind of, as soon as I started writing the, the first Rosie Gilmer book, which is, it wasn't gangland, but it was a, a story, it was a journalist who was at the, the main character. As soon as I started writing that book, it, all of that, that was all the story of my life kind of thing. Only exaggerated and embellished, but yeah, that's what led me to it. And, and then we started, um, the publishers thought that, that since there was gangsters in the Rosie books, they said, look, why don't you write a gangster thing? Because there was, people think people were out there, like Martina and Mandy Sue, and I thought, I don't know if I could do that, because gangsters aren't the people that you really, you really like. So I started to do it, and I, I found that I quite liked it, you know, for the moment anyway. Well, mm. for the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, thank you for sharing your, your journeys into, into becoming, you know, those, those authors. I, I wonder, is there a defining moment in this journey where you can say, I am, I am a writer. Now, you know, I, I know, Anna, that you're a journalist, so you've been writing... Um, mm -hmm. But that sense of tale to say, I am a crime writer, and and do you own that identity? Uh, I know it's only part of your identity, but Marnie, do you own that identity? So when was the moment, and are you happy to own that identity? Oh yeah, I'm very happy to own it, definitely. Um, for me, I wrote The Girl Who Wouldn't Die in 2009, and that that's my best-selling book about the criminologist Georgina McKenzie, who works with the Dutch police um and you know that that series there's five books and the overarching theme is trafficking so again that touches on gangs and you know shipping in contraband and stuff and, and the trade of people um so i suppose when i'd finished writing that um i had i parted company with my first agent who specialized in children's fiction um, and then I think that once I signed to my current agent, who I've been with for six and a half years or something, quite a while, and he was going to represent that and not the children's fiction, I realised then uh, that I was a crime writer. So it was that first book, him having signed me, and then especially when I got my deal with Harper Collins for it, um, I realised that I had to inhabit a new identity i had been an aspiring children's or well i'd been a published children's mm -hmm. author mm -hmm. and and suddenly i realized that um i i, I felt like a, a chrysalis i'd metamorphosed into something different and i was happy to be that person mm. i love the way you describe that of you know that that transformation that's gone on and um, and i'm moving then from journalism into fiction writing did you sense a moment of change a defining moment that said i am a crime writer you know um as a, to, to be a writer was always had always been my dream long before even i was a journalist that was all i wanted to do like, from I was any age and when i was a journalist at the record and i suppose once a journalist always a journalist but when i was a journalist at the record i, I began writing my, my first novel which wasn't a crime novel but it was quite well acclaimed. It was a, it's a rites of passage novel, Spit Against the Wind, which still sells, believe it or not. And um, another novel, there was a two book deal. <clears throat> and I quite enjoyed doing it, especially Spit Against the Wind. It was, a, it was told in the first person. And I liked the other one too, but it wasn't enough, as uh, Mary was saying earlier, it didn't <laughs> because I thought I want to do something more. And it just felt like what I was doing at the record was, I felt this is like being in somebody else's movie here. Some of the things and some of the doors you would knock. And I thought, I want this to be a story. And I and I told my publishers, but anyway, they didn't they weren't keen on that because, like you, Mary, you switch genres. You switch genres; it's quite difficult. Um, but they didn't have a, a great lot of faith in that, and and I was a kind of a drift for a couple of years. And then, uh, but I wrote this first novel, the, the Rosie novel, was a Rosie Gilmer novels, which was they called The Dead Won't Sleep. And it was while writing that I think I felt oh, this is this is good because you were you were going into dark places in, in, in Rosie's mind as well. I managed to create, create her and she was quite dark with something in the past of her. And all the things that, the places that she would go as a journalist that I had been. And I thought, I, I felt as if I was, I was writing crime then, but maybe it wasn't supposed to, it wasn't as, as crime like, as defined by gangland crime. Mm -hmm. 
but it was, there was darkness to it and that was what made me feel better and it, it, it appealed to me and it, it got more and more. It's now more so because of the gangsters you're writing about all the time. Mm. Thank you. I think, I Thank think for me, um, I wanted to, I mean, the, book, the sort of books I really enjoyed at the time when I started writing, uh, I loved The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And I know Stig Larson has been pilloried for, you know, uh, Salander is his fantasy and blah, blah, blah. And who is he to write, a, a, you know, a heroine? With any authenticity but I really enjoyed them um, you know my my ex-husband's half Swedish and and so that side of the family are all Scandi and and I found them I loved her because she's kind of a punky character and I'm an ex-punk and and still punking punking the heart <laughs> and but most of all it's the thrills I love that page turning element of crime fiction and I don't think you get that really in any other genre you do to a certain extent with kids adventures but you know I want I want to read a book that sets my pulse racing and yeah. you have to go on to that next chapter and you have to solve the puzzle it's I think it's the genre that makes the reader work the hardest <laughs> mm. so that for me you know that was always going to be the genre for me I think mm. and I like what you're saying about the page turning thing as well like when you write something and you're writing it so fast I write very very fast that I usually have I write in the afternoons of a couple of cups of coffee and, and I write very, very fast. And sometimes I write a scene because and, and because it's moving you the way I would read a, read somebody else's book and say, oh, I need to turn the page. And it feels great to, I, I remember writing a scene, it was a rape scene and uh, it was a marital rape scene. And I remember going away for a walk and coming back after I wrote it and I almost was reading it and thinking, my God, who wrote this? And it was me. But that's how I was feeling because you, you were writing something that was um, is, is a bit disturbing and... and <laughs> <clears throat> and you know, and that that I like. I quite if I'm reading something, I quite like to. But it's that that to me is a great, a great joy to be writing something that you feel you want to turn the page. So it's it's it's, it's, it's very. I really I think it is a genre that people that you get more out of. For me, anyway, I think I don't know if I can write anything else. One of the things that um, I found really difficult uh, when I first started writing is that editors they always want you to write a character that's um, likable. And crime fiction's the only genre, really, where you can get away with writing good baddies, mm -hmm. bad goodies, and all the, all the things in between. And th I think that the characters, if you get them right in crime fiction, are you, so much more I identifiable and realistic. And yeah. um, that, uh, that also is a real pull for me. Mm. Yeah, I remember reading my, uh, my, uh, Martina Cole wrong before I was ever even considered doing crime when I was doing my, my very first novel and thinking why am I like this guy he's just he sat at the table with these kids but he's just been back having cut somebody's throat because that's what they did and I was thinking and I'm, I'm, wanting, I'm wanting to win and I thought that's really weird and um, but, um, that's, that's, that's the thing about writing about crime doing crime so it's, it's, it's very different. Mm. Do you know I, I'm just thinking as you're talking um, the engagement of the reader and and the page turning and and i wonder could we liken crime fiction you know to being on on that roller coaster or that fairground ride that you know you don't know where it's going to take you and the whip around the corner and it might flip you and it might throw you in the air and and it is it's not it's not just you know a, a reading exercise but it, it's an emotional exercise as well yeah it's an intellectual challenge i think mm. but what i think is like psychological noir is much more a very slow paced development of character and relationship so that's much more akin to women's like traditional women's fiction but with a, a dark element mm -hmm. um, but the sort of stuff that anna and i write and um crime thrillers in particular um it is different. It feels much more visceral and 3D and it's much more of an adventure. Yeah. You know what I mean? Much faster. It's necessarily much faster paced. Mm. And that's what's great when people read your books and, they, and they, they put something on Facebook saying I was up all night. I started it and I couldn't stop it. And that's a great thing because if I've got a book like that. <clears throat> I do a lot of audio books and listen to books and, I, and I'm walking for hours and thinking, my God, you can't put it down. And I think you get a lot of that with crime novels especially. And, and it, it's, it's an adventure and it's, it's a bit of a roller coaster and very exciting to do and to read. Mm. 
And is it not as well that, you know, you, you set as the challenge, um, there are crimes to be solved or there's revenge to be had, uh, pr the price to be paid. And, you know, we want to get to the end to see that that has been done. Yeah. But I wonder as authors, do you, do you ever want to just leave us with things hanging as well? Do you, do, you know, do you feel the need to tie everything up? Or are you quite happy to leave some breadcrumbs maybe for the next in the series um, or just to let something go? Because um, in a previous set of interviews I've done, um, one of the authors said, because life's like that, not everything is, is always solved. Yeah. Well, certainly I've, I've never written anything but series. Um, so with Born Bad, I mean, that does end with a big question mark. And some of the reviews i mean the reviews were overwhelmingly good but there were there was the odd reader that's like oh this wasn't resolved it's it's almost like a cliffhanger i feel cheated but you know i knew that the cover up was going to come and I, it's like when you watch a really good tv show there's nothing better than like oh fuck i want to know what happens next they've left me high and dry i've got to watch the next episode. Again, yeah. but i yeah. can't watch it till next next time so for me that's a, a like you say that's like life and b it's much more rewarding i think as if you're doing a series but editors tend to like you to tie up all the loose ends um and i can see if you're doing a standalone you have to do it really yeah yeah, yeah. what about for you anna how does it feel i think if i'm doing it as i'm doing them um, i tie up usually the loose ends of the storyline that has to be has to be solved in a set and lots of, and some of the minor characters but the main characters, I like to leave it in a bit of a cliffhanger. And in fact, the end game ends, like everybody's saying, how did you end it? Like, Why did you end it like that? It's not resolved. And I said, well, I'm, I'm writing the new one. And I thought, well, we'll leave it. And it, it is, it's one of the more cliffhangers than, that I've done than I've ever done. Because there's not, it's not resolved in the main part of the story. But it will be, hopefully, to some extent, but, but, in the new one frame. But I think it's better, because uh, but like that, when I'm watching something, I, I watch lots of television, and like, like, a scene that can leave you, Say what the hell was like, like the Ozark? I watched the Ozark and I've just yeah, watched it, awesome. it, Brenda, but I've just finished the last one, the new series. And the way yeah, that I've seen is, I mean, not that I just never expected that. And if you could to write, I thought, who? And that was the last time I was expecting what happened in that last scene. Yeah. So to create, to, for somebody creating that is a genius. But it's good yeah. to try and create something that people want to. I think really is, is what, what what is the, the main thing for me is. If, so, if somebody likes the character, they'll want to get on the back, they'll, they'll want to read the next one as well. But it's yeah. good to have something unresolved just hanging there. So they'll see if they like her, then they'll get back to the, the next one as well. Well, I think in a series, if you've got returning characters, they have to have an arc anyway. Yeah. They have to have a developmental arc. So there's always going to be, um, you know, this kind of unresolved air about them. Else, yeah. else it's not something that the reader can kind of invest in longer term mm. yeah. and I, I was talking with a, a book club last night that i'm part of um and they were saying how for them if if an author presents all the characters almost <laughs> like pre-packed yeah it, it's not the same as as, as you were saying money if, if if a character goes on on a journey even a minor character mm -hmm. that it's not just there and presented so yeah yeah I've, you mentioned ozark i I came late to the party, but sure. oh God, I'm glad I came to the party. And then it made me think about um, how we view, or I mean, again, I wonder, is it a generational thing or not? But the whole thing of binge watching, uh, you know, I mean, I know for me growing up, you had to wait till the next episode. It wasn't already there. You couldn't stream it, couldn't whatever. And I, and I wonder, coming back to writing crime fiction, because of the process that is involved. Um, do you think it's fair to have this thing of writing on a, on a yearly basis? You know, often publishers want you to have the next thing lined up, ready to go. Is that fair for the process of creativity? Well, I write a couple of books a year, generally. Um, but then, you know, I was with Avon and now I'm with Trapeze. So that's those are commercial imprints. And I think that that model is to have you bring out a couple of books a year to keep your readership interested in what you've got to say next. 
Um, and in fact, I find if I do one book in a year, then I'm, I'm itchy scratchy. You know, the devil mm -hmm. finds work for idle hands. Having said that, though, I spent most of last year writing a historical saga and it took me a good nine months. So my crime output, I had um, Tightrope came out January last year or, or what? No, no, July last year. And then Backlash came out in January. And, and then there's going to be a bit of a pause for crime for me until I see what's happening with the manuscript that I've just delivered to my agent. Um, I don't know. I, I like to do a couple of books a year. I've got, I've got too much energy, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Anna, are you the same? No, not a couple of books a year. I've always only done one book a year. That was always the deal. It was always a two book deal or a three book deal over three years. And um, But it's kind of narrowed it. Um, I find it's been a bit narrowed since the gangland thing came in. I always end up, uh, it's probably about one every nine months or something. Mm. Uh, but but I mean, I can do more. I, I, I sound as if I need to apply myself more like my <laughs> <laughs> no, I think nine months is ideal because... Um, if you're do if you're banging out two a year, which I have done for the past five years, it does it get, you start to weigh yourself a bit thin. Yeah, well, I'm doing it. You know, I'm I'm doing something else just now, and I won't go into detail about it. But I'm writing another novel um, after Framed, so that's what I've been I've been doing a bit of work on that over uh, recent months. I've been writing it for a long time on and off, um, and I'm thinking to myself because the rate I write it when I start to write, I probably could easily write two books again. Now I've said that out loud and the publishers will see this. <laughs> you almost said you could only do one a year. <laughs> no, but you can though, you can though, because sometimes like, like Marnie, it, is, it isn't enough because once that book's finished, it's a whole year before it comes out. Yeah. You know, and stuff like that, that doesn't take up like, a massive amounts of time. So the, the thing is, you probably, probably shouldn't. You probably need the money anyway. So, you know. Well, I think the problem with doing two a year is your publisher doesn't necessarily have enough spend oh, yeah. to market more than one book a year mm -hmm. so oh. then you're in you're in a bit of a difficult situation of you might do two really great books in a year and put your heart and soul into them but you know they don't do maybe as well as they could do than if they'd have the marketing spend to give it a push once a year so that's that's always a, con a difficult conundrum to balance with yeah publishing. yeah Mm. And, and I think as readers, um, I know some people will be very well aware of the process of, of, of a book either reaching the shelf or reaching the Kindle. But for many of us, you know, we, we're just really happy consumers of the things that you write and don't often understand, you know, when, when there's a book launch, for you that book was finished so long ago you know when it first comes to us you, you know, you're on with the next thing and, and, I, and I'm always intrigued by that process and I wanted to ask you from conception to birth which bit do you struggle most with you know is it morning sickness at the start or is it the actual delivery moment at the end editing yeah the editing I fucking hate editing yeah. <laughs> I hate editing, but I mean, I'm, they always tell me that I'm notoriously um, sloppy. And I mean, I can spell and all that kind of thing and do all the right things, but even when I read something 20 times, I send it over and it's got the type three times or something, and they'll say, why, what, read it, why? And I do read it, but I hate editing, I hate the whole process, and because I sometimes say, once you've done it, you've done it, and um, but you have to change it, because it's great to have a fresh eye who, who can look at it and say, no, you need to... It always makes it so much better. Well, it does make it so much better, but I sometimes I have to be dragged, kicking and screaming to, to make it better. You know, I'll say, well, I'm not going to change that. Well, think about it and they sort of cajole you. And I have to have a good week of calming down after getting yeah. editorial notes. Exactly. I just want to... I've got the secret fist. <laughs> yeah, all of that, all of that stuff. And, um, but it's good. Sometimes one of the things that are difficult for me as well is in the middle of a book trying to keep it keep because the, the, the books kind of books we write and your books too they're, they're pacey paced to them mm -hmm. uh, but there is a story that has to be resolved as well or more or less resolved but i sometimes think find in the middle of the book the thing i'm doing just now sometimes in the middle of the book you think how am i going to keep that pace up and i think it's very hard from forty thousand to uh, maybe thirty forty thousand to sixty seventy thousand is really hard graft and i find the more i write i mean i'm I'm heading towards having 20 books published or something like that now. The more I write, the harder it gets. And I have got to the stage where I like having written. 
I think Erin Kelly said that a couple of years ago. She says, I like having written. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it's, good to have, it's good to have all these books that they can't take away from me anyway. That's all we do. <laughs> but it is, I sometimes think it's just getting harder as I'm, get, as I'm getting, not getting older, but the more I write. But if you, that's why sometimes it was good to switch a bit to the gangland thing because uh, that gave me a whole draft of new characters that I didn't think I would ever be able to write about but any convincing me. And that has made everybody want to read the Rosie book. So sometimes it's good to flip a little bit and see what else that you can, what else you can do. So well, I think that you move. You're doing your head, hey? A historical novel that you've written. The, the oh yes, Nurse Kitty. Right? Nurse I mean, Kitty Longthorn. It's all about the uh, the birth of the NHS. <laughs> That looks brilliant. Yeah. I can't wait to see that. I'll get that in audio. I like my audio books when I'm driving to the end. Well, for, I have written it like a true crime writer, so there's still quite, you know, quite fast pace, you know, page turning ends of chapters and stuff like that, and quite a lot of grit to it. So, I mean, I, I'm very familiar with sagas because my mother used to burn through three a week. Um, and I've written historical before, my kids' stuff was historical. But um, I suppose you, you're always going to bring your crime writing techniques to bear, mm -hmm. even if it's a different genre. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's just the way you write, because you write, like when I write tightrope, you're writing pictures a lot of the time the way I do as well, and comment. But uh, it's, uh, I, write, I write kind of in pictures no matter what I write. When I was writing the very first novel that wasn't crime, it's, it's, a, it's pictures of people. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's, that's kind of how I write in that, in that way. So that's quite exciting to do. I mean, I think that because I moved from Georgine, the Georgina McKenzie books, um, which were about, you know, they were Euro noir effectively and about trafficking. And then I went to Born Bad and the cover up, which was Man Mancunian noir, gangland fiction. And then Tightrope and Backlash of, you know, they're PI, they're books about a PI. But as a person over the years, you move on and things happen to you. And I'd, I'd got divorced and, and found myself, you know, a single mother and trying to scratch, scratch together a living. And, you know, I was able to create this whole new heroine who was a single parent and, you know, she'd had to start after an, I mean, I had a very nice divorce, but she had to start after an acrimonious one. And it's quite satisfying to keep yourself fresh. Yeah. To begin something with new characters, but then to be able to do subsequent books because you do inevitably fall in fall in love a bit with your main characters, I think. Yeah. I was gonna, I, I, you, you, thank you, Moni, because you bring me perfectly to the next question. <laughs> it's great, yes, and we didn't even practice this. Um, but, but the notion of, because you both have so many books to your name and shifting from one series to the next, so, so Anna, you know, from, from Rosie to Kerry, you know almost like leaving somebody behind in a way although those books are always there um and then going as you say money from you know from 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 george mckenzie georgina to bev saunders um i wonder could we talk about the that that moment where it's time to move on so as ever too complicated a question maybe but the creation of one knowing it's time to move on and starting afresh it's making me think about romance and relationships how you know you know when you're done you know it's time to go the decision to go and then starting afresh with someone new and settling into that newness mm. yeah i thought that was that would be quite hard for me the suggestion was made to me why don't you do this and i thought i'll never be able to do that and then it came from me, I thought, I'll, I'll never be able to sustain anything for a, for a whole novel and create characters like that. But then I, I found it surprisingly came very, very natural to me because I started to write about, I started with a scene, it was a scene I had in my head, it was a funeral scene, with the first one, the first Rosie book, Blood Feud, not Rosie book, uh, Kerry book. And I thought, and I took that scene out of, not the bloodshed, but the, the, the characters in, in a scene, like the mother's talking and the, and the daughter talking and the two older like, generation talking. Uh, and I took a scene out of something somebody said to me years ago. My mum said to me, and it was a, it was a, it was years, years and years ago, and, I, and, I, and they were all poor and things like that. And so they, remember that Neil Sedaka song, "The Hungry Years," mm. uh, and "Miss the Hungry Years." And my mama used to tell me that um, her, her, an old auntie of mine had, the, the, they were singing in the band. There was a band singing in, in some workman club they were in or something, and the auntie said to her when they started singing it, 
I don't miss the hungry years. They were hellish. And I thought, and I, that, that touched me when my mum said it. And, it. and that's the kind of things that, that, I, that I fester about for years. And it kind of touched me. And, I, and I, when I was writing this book, the Kerry book, I thought, well, I have to, I'm going to build a whole novel around this thing. This thing. And, I, and then that's how I built Kerry and the funeral scene and her coming up, because she's a sort of high power lawyer. And she comes back to that scene. And the mother actually says that in the, in the opening scene at the funeral. I, I don't miss that. And that, because that strikes up in the band and that. And it was funny, it was really the time I finished that scene. And it's, it, it's great because I can thank my mother for telling me that. Mm. Uh, but it start, that started the ball rolling. And I thought, but we can do something here. But it was a, it was a real feeling your way in the beginning. But good. I mean, for me, I found with the George Mackenzie series, um, after five books, I'd had enough, and I felt George had had enough, and Van den Bergen had had enough, and and their relationship split up. And and I'd, I'm pleased with that story, the girl who had no fear. But um, oh no, it was the girl who got revenge. <laughs> Getting bloody mixed up. But um, I'd had enough, and I think that the characters had had finished telling their stories, and you don't want to become repetitive especially when you've got the same overarching theme. But with, with Born Bad and the cover-up, I could have written more, but I changed publishers. So mm -hmm. I left HarperCollins and went to Orion. And, um, and then, you know, my editor wanted something new. So Bev came along and, uh, and I've written two Bev books. So, you know, sometimes it's just something practical that necessitates a change. Like, you know, uh, publishers don't necessarily want to continue... Mm -hmm. some another publisher's sloppy seconds in in a sense um yeah. and it's it's frustrating slightly for the for the author because you feel like there are stories left untold for those characters in the other series um but it is what it is and it doesn't mean that you can't go back to them in the future uh especially i, I still get people writing to me readers and asking what's happening with this character what's is there going to be another book in this series? And there's a lady in Goodreads who's got in touch with me, but I've lost my Goodreads login, so I can't respond to her. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, um, it's strange. Sometimes you get abrupt endings in life, though. So. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed, yeah. Again, that... Sorry, Anna. Just to say that when you've, you're talking about going back to them, sometimes if you've got these things and you're familiar with it and you've moved on and you new books and new, new, even sometimes new genre. It's quite good that you've got them so that you think, because people write to me about certain books and they could they, they, they be any more. And I'm, I think, well, you know, they might be sometime because you know them and you can go back to them. You just have to freshen things, if, I suppose, in the future. Mm -hmm. If that happens, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's good to do that. Mm. Sorry, Thank I'm you. looking over at my radiator. I blocked up a wasp's nest and I'm sure I can hear the fuckers trying to get in. Oh God. Can you not get some, <laughs> the wasp man out to spray it? Yeah. Yes, every year, get them out. Yeah. Give give us a yell if we need to stop. If you need to do anything, because we can always stop and do a do a, a wee snip. If uh, if you want to check. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. All right. So, talking then about these these characters that you've created, um, and and characters that I know from reading the reviews are extremely popular mm. uh, with with your readers. Uh, great affection uh, for these you know for these female characters that you've created but one of the themes as I've been doing this online festival during lockdown is a question that was originally mooted by Susan Heads from from the book trail was asking if you had to choose one of your characters who would you have in lockdown with you so I'm going to riff on that theme and I'm going to say of these two main protagonists in these series that you've created and i'm sorry you can only have one of them okay and you don't have to sacrifice anybody else in your household to have them in with you okay because uh, in one of the panel one of the authors is a bit concerned do i need to trade my family for this protagonist no which which one would you have and why would you have them Oh God, that's really difficult. That's a difficult question too. Anyway. I'd have to say, I'd have to say George Mackenzie actually, because she's she's really bright and really interesting, and I think that she'd be good to get drunk with, although she's much younger than me. I suppose by the end, by the last book, she was in her thirties. Mm -hmm. So yeah, 
Yeah, so you choose and, and not Bev, you wouldn't take Bev because? Bev's a dirty get. <laughs> she's, she's, she's just a bit of a, a you know slattern around the house and I, I'm quite a neat nick and I, I look Bev's brilliant and she's a good laugh and gets up to a terrible mischief but a she's got a sex addiction so she'd probably end up wanking in every room of the house <laughs> and b um she just wouldn't clean up after herself and that'd do my head in so not maybe a pleasant house guest in, no. in these conditions. Totally. Whereas George Mackenzie is really anally retentive like me. <laughs> George Mackenzie, the, is George Mackenzie the, um, the computer guy? No, no, no George that's Mackenzie's, Doc. Um, yeah, that's Doc. He's a messy get as well. But um, George Mackenzie is the criminologist from my first oh, series. Yeah. Right, right, right. And um, she's a council estate kid like me. That's, that She went to Cambridge as I did and has made a, a kind of career for herself, um, you know, in uh, academia, but also working with the police. And I suppose if I'd gone a, down a different path in life, she's the person that I most have ended up like. You know, I am really interested in criminology. If I did a PhD, which I hope to when I reach retirement age, mm. whatever that is in the future, I will do something along those lines. So she, she, she's much more like me, really, and much more of an autobiographical character. You know, Bev has elements, you know, she's a divorcee and stuff, but she's kind of the opposite of me in many ways. Thank you. So, Anna, have you managed to decide? Thank you. That's quite a hard question, that, because um, we quite easily see for lockdown, you would have big Adrian in the house because uh, he's a handy man to have around. <laughs> I have him in the house because he's fascinating about all his, you know, his life and as a, as a refugee and all the kind of Bosnia and stuff that come back. Plus the fact he's, he's I made him very attractive and he's lovely. <laughs> him, I would have him in, uh, for some of the lockdown and then I might get fed up with him, but I would also have him... Um, I like Sharon Potter uh, in, in the books, who's the, the, the woman who came in to join uh, Kerry Casey, Kerry Casey's mm -hmm. gang. She was Knuckles Boyle's wife, who was almost uh, trying to be, they're trying to execute her. And she shot them all, and, and then she's joined forces with them. And she's a real tough cookie with uh, all the, she knows where all the bodies are buried. And she would be funny because she's, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a huge drinker of a, certainly not as much these days in the afternoons and things, but she would be up there and drinking her gin at five o'clock at night and, and uh, with her beads on and her necklace on, telling the tales of Costa del Sol and things. And I quite, I'm quite fascinated by her, and I'm, re I'm still kind of getting to know her a bit, a bit more. Gin time's four o'clock in my house. <laughs> <laughs> but I do like the, 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 that opportunity, you know, lockdown, and you saying, Anna, about, you know, a character that I am still getting to know. And mm. I think lockdown is, is that perfect, maybe yeah. opportunity That's to do good that. Question. Good question. Get mm. people talking. Now, the darkness that you certainly explore throughout your whole range of work, both of you. And, and I wanted to ask the question of, in everything that you've written, what is the grimmest situation that you have put a protagonist in? And were you disturbed in writing that yourself? Oh God. Uh. I'm trying, to run, I'm trying to run over all my own books now. Um, I think for me, um, Sheila O'Brien in, in Born Bad and the cover-up has to do... It was certainly the cover-up when she's head of the Manchester gangland, you know, the kind of South Manchester family. She, she suddenly has to make the transition from trophy wife to hard head of business and is she has to give the order for a kill. And let's just say that a grass ends up with his head in a K Kentucky fried chicken bucket. And, and I think that to make that kind of call when you're not used to being, you know, when you're not used to being involved in the, the violence uh, and to suddenly know that you have to instill fear in your subordinates and your rivals, that kind of having to step up and change up and become a person that you're not naturally, you know, that's the most uncomfortable thing that my characters faced, I think. Yeah. I think for me, um, uh, possibly the Rosie character, 
uh, because she, a lot of the different books she goes to different places and one of them she goes to Morocco and so I think it might be the second book actually to tell the truth when they go in search of these a child that's been snatched from the beach oh. and they go they go to Morocco and, and the whole thing in, in Morocco they're in this uh, so it's a place a real uh, dirty little back street town which is where they're, they're, they're keeping these, these people but they're driving through the town and she's she's just terrified all the time and then there's a moment when they're when they find the children in a farmhouse and and and, and she's she's witnessing all these horrible children that have been there for weeks some of them starved and things like that so that that was a very horrible kind of scene to put in and then but the people who are chasing her but i'm wasting the story for somebody here but the people who are chasing that then the place gets fire firebombed and set in fire and she's in and when i was writing that um i was kind of choking with the smoke and people the people who she was with were trying to bring get get out and batter the door down and try and bring a child out if they could and it was all and i felt when i was writing that i thought that's too much and people who read it um we're, we're all horrified, especially people with children. We're saying, oh, God, I couldn't read that scene. Um, my sister just turns pages over when they're at that. Mm. Sometimes, uh, I think when I was when I was writing that, but she's not taking, like, Kerry did some things in, in the books, the Kerry books where she's slapped some pimp around, which would not be like her. And I'm thinking, because I would never hit anybody in, in the sound of somebody getting their face smacked and things. Now that's what, I, that, that what she did as a, as a as a being a harder woman. Whereas I think for Rosie, there was the fear in that that she was going to just die here on this, there's nobody here to help her in the middle of nowhere in, the, in Morocco and farmland, desert farmland. And I, I, that, that was a, for me, was quite a kind of fear thing to write. Mm, thank you. I, I, from the darkness, then redemption, um, do you do you give us, when we read your stories, do you give us the, 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 the despite the grimness, despite the grittiness, um, the crime and the evil, because, you know, again, you, you talk about people trafficking and child pornography rings. Um, none of these are easy subjects, you know, to read. But do you give us some hope for any of these characters? Marnie, do you believe in redemption? Um, yeah, I do. Um... Although, I don't know, I think some people are just so damaged and some of my characters are so damaged that they are beyond redemption, really. And, and that's true in life. You know, the, the prisons are full of people that could, you know, could um, become better people and be rehabilitated. But, you know, there's probably more psychopaths who had very damaging childhoods and very damaging and did some dreadful things as adults and i don't know that there's necessarily a way back for them because it, it just you know their brain follows certain grooves and there's there's no way of channeling new neural pathways when violence is hardwired into your system so i think my bad buddies you know maybe they have something to admire or or and you know the reader and enjoys hating them or you know maybe the charismatic but sometimes that evil festers like a canker and and there's just no way of stripping it out but then you get you get some characters where you you know there are shades of like i said they are in in the realm of shades of gray and they can be heroes and they can be horrors mm. they can be all of those things because mm. that's what life is like really mm. um and in my books to temper the the grit and you know the violence and the darkness i try and put quite a lot of dark humor in there um because life is like that you know growing up in a, a rough uh, hello a rough estate <laughs> on man in in manchester um people are really funny mm -hmm. people try and find the the bright side and the funny side when they're on the bones of their arse and life is really tough so you know, it's it's kind of the humour in the grey areas that I employ to to make the reading possible for the reader. And I have to say, I love the fact that that humour, I can hear you in that humour. It's, you know, it, it's it's that playfulness that you bring into life as well. I, I do like well, that. I've just written a manuscript that has no humour in it at all. I mean, it's quite hard to do. I thought I'd write something grown up and serious. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was hard. It was hard. Anna, redemption? 
redemption. Some of the really badass characters, like as Manly says, there's, they're beyond redemption, and, and some of them, they all you know, people, some of them just get shot in the book and, and killed in that because that's what that's what's what that has come to them. And, and one of them who did get that in the end was a uh, Knuckles Boyle. He was Sharon's uh, husband who had planned to execute her because it, she was a certain age and he was fed up with her and, and was a rich gangster with lots of money and partly in Spain and partly in Manchester. And he was planning to have her done in where his mates on the way to the airport and she was going for a trip with her friends. Anyway, that all went to something for him. But, um, but there was a point where he was on his own there and they have a son, you see. And, and there was, there was, there was, I just made it wee shades of it where he was get that he was getting to know the son. He'd got he'd picked the son up at private school, and, and he was now stuck with him. Wouldn't give her back, him him back. And there was parts of it where he was, you had him thinking, could I have done better with the boy? You know, the boy's there, and the boy's getting upset. The boy hates him because he doesn't want to be like him. He's just he's going to educate himself, and so the boy's so uncomfortable and so sad. But there was, there was I just put in wee shades because I, I, I it wasn't that I wanted to redeem him in some ways, but I thought, I just thought, well, what, what if, what if? He's full of regret and I kind of made him, at one point they're sitting and he gets the boy a pizza and the boy says, can I go to bed now? And he's, yeah, on you go. And he's not used to being a father like that. And mm -hmm. he lets go and he's sort of thinking, and that's towards the end of the book. And he's thinking, was there, was, there, was there something I could have done in my life that this boy's now 14? Of course, he doesn't get a lot of time to, to get that done because of what happens to him. Um, but... Uh, that I just that that went down quite well. It seemed to go down because people liked him because he was always getting portrayed as a, as a sort of blustery guy, so but quite thick, mm -hmm. and so like you'd get a bit of humour out of him being a hard man and a ruthless man. But he was pretty thick at the, the basic thing. But I just didn't and give a bit of humanity into him to him. Even he was asking himself questions about his mm -hmm. raising of his son. Uh, but it was all too late, I'm afraid. So mm -hmm. it was come off. But I, but I love, again, you coming back to that notion. I, I, Marnie's mentioned, you know, that, you know, even even the worst of characters, there's aspects that, that can be endearing. Now, good women, I am aware of time. Um, and, and whilst we may be in lockdown, I'm sure there's writing that you need to do and things like that. But normally I set off these conversations by saying, you know, pu publication at the minute, getting the you know the word out about books and things like that has been tricky or maybe you know a book was was on a trajectory and then it had to stop because you know maybe visits as you were saying money festivals haven't happened where you'd be talking about a book mm -hmm. so i wonder could we round off our time together by saying tell us about and it's not to do an elevator pitch because it always sounds a little bit mm -mm, why should we read your book i know we should be reading your books but the latest book that's out, if you could give us, um, you know, a little flavour for anybody who hasn't had a chance to get hold of that yet, what is it and why should we be reading it, do you think? Well, um, my, uh, my latest book is Backlash and it's the second uh, Bev Saunders PI thriller, but it can be read as a standalone. And um, it was great fun to write and I think, it, you know, readers have, are enjoying it. Um, the baddie in the book is called um, Anthony Anthony and his nickname is Two-Tone, so bad they named him twice. And he's a, he's a landscaper and uh, living in a Pennine village, a well-heeled Pennine village. And um, this guy, a piano tuner called Jim Higson, who's a staid old bloke with his wife, uh, Penny, um, they go to Bev and complain about this neighbour, Two-Tone, who's driving them bloody mad with his parties that are all, all hours of the night. And, um, you know, he's, he's a kind of really, Two-Tone is, is a well-heeled uh, wide boy. So, you know, he's a manual labourer that's done really well for himself mm -hmm. and he gives to the community. And it seems to be a neighbour dispute. Bev's case, but actually when she does some digging, she uncovers um, links to Manchester spice trade. Uh, and Bev goes undercover as Gail, two tones cleaner, and hilarity <laughs> ensues. So she's there with a Vileda bucket and a wig on and Deirdre Barlow glasses. And she, you know, she's got to navigate his awful dog. And, uh, and you know, she has... Um, ill-considered sex with uh, Archie, his foreman. <laughs> so I think, I think it's, it's, a, it's a book worth reading because 
you know, Bev's an interesting character in, his, in herself and she teams up with Doc, her kind of Oxford graduate computer sidekick. And they're, they're a really unlikely duo. But I think it's possibly the first time in crime fiction that I'm aware of where the buddy, you know, you kind of exploring the trades, you know, the buddy is a tradesman and that kind of working class done well character mm. isn't often something that you read about in crime fiction. But by Christ, there's, a, you know, most most uh, builders and landscapers and sparkies have got some kind of tales to tell. Um and of course, it's Manchester spice trade, which, you know, the spice is the zombie drug that's written about a lot in the press. And mm. I wanted to explore that and how the hypocrisy of, um, you know, how you scratch the surface of, of kind of suburbia and find all sorts of nasties just beneath. So. More than the neighbour from hell. Yeah, backlash. Thank you. Anna, um, Endgame, yeah, is Endgame, Endgame. I thought, you know, we're talking here about books, and, and I'm, I, we were talking earlier on about when you write a book, by the time it comes to being published, you're already in your other book. And I had to think, there's shit. It's not Endgame. Of, it's Endgame if they talk about not framed, which is the one that's, that I've just finished. Uh, so just to go back to Endgame, Endgame was the second in the series of uh, the, of Kerry Casey. Blood Feud was the first, and the whole series is built on uh, Kerry Casey uh, being the reluctant gangster and and trying to trying to uh, get her family out of the mire, out of that, and and that certainly they'll have done it with the money that they've got through, through drugs and through the kind of life that her father had built. But they'd never he had never been involved in heroin before. So the whole premise of of the series to make Kerry likable was that they weren't um, they were dealing in cocaine and that thing in heroin when she got there, and she she was had made the pledge, this is not who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly got a lot of problems. So the idea of her is to get them all uh, so that she can have a place at the top table of a businesswoman with business enterprise all over the place. Anyway, mm -hmm. they've, they've upset the, the Colombians, which isn't as good. <laughs> so they've upset the Colombians, and that was at the end of, of, of Blood Feud. So she had pissed off um, some very, very dangerous people. And then at the start of Endgame, Endgame's a lot about the, they're, they're, they're up for revenge. And this, the, this, the, the kidnap a wee, a wee baby, a wee boy, who's um, uh, Marty, Marty, our lawyer, Marty Kane's son. And that the book is about them trying to get him back and try, and then uh, the other part of the book is that they're now, they're going to steal the Colombian cocaine. So, and, and it's like 90 million, 100 and 150 million pounds of it. And the idea that you try to sell your readers that they'll steal this cocaine and they'll build this great, great big legitimate hotel complex in Spain, which is nearly built now, uh, but they're doing it with their money. So that becomes quite a kind of a, they, they chase the sort of, the, the two, two aspects, the, the heartbreak of the, and if the Columbians have got this boy, then they're going to kill him. He's only a wee baby boy at five. And, and Marty Keane, who's a, a lawyer, family lawyer, but a kind of criminal family lawyer, who's probably just as much as a, as a criminal and, and knows all the secrets as, as, a, as um, the, anybody, as, as other, as, as criminals are. So it's very much enmeshed in the whole thing. And it's his, his, uh, his conscience and him trying to deal with his son and the fact that they've stolen his kid because of what he does. Uh, so there's all of that human aspect of it and Kerry just, you know, just pulling out all the stops and you see her becoming a gangster to, to, be, to beat these people at their own game. And then uh, the, the, there's the aspect with, with Vinny when something happens there and uh, she's pregnant. And then the whole, the whole thing towards the end of the book it's her and Vinnie and well they won't they and then the book finishes with like that. And I don't know. But it's a, but it's a bigger cliffhanger than that. I'm not describing it very well. I don't no, know. no, you mustn't. No spoilers, don't yeah, no. Let us let us get to that cliff. Well, good women, I want to thank you so much for your time and your discussions. And and I'm sorry that we, we have to close because I could listen to you talk about your work and, and your thoughts on, 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 on things. Um, all the very best uh, yeah. with, with your books. Um, and as I say, I really look forward to, to doing this in real life, as they say. Um, okay. Next May, please come back to, to Newcastle or come to Newcastle if you've never been. I know, Anna, you said you've been through on the train, but come and just enjoy a weekend in the tomb with us, yeah? Good for now. See you, Jackie. Yeah, great to see you. And you, Anna. And to see both of you. It's a great question and good crack. 
yes stay safe and see you soon yeah Bye. Bye. thanks for having us Bye. Bye.